The Lori Vallow case caught the attention of the world as we observed a seemingly uncaring mother arrogantly defying the court, refusing to tell the truth concerning the whereabouts of her own children. But as the media began to unravel the horrific past of a seemingly homicidal religious zealot, I began to dig through her public persona, and what I found was a familiar and tragic story, one that until today has been successfully obscured through a haze of perplexing religious dogma and lies. It is a tale that when fully unraveled will help you to understand the dangerous conditions that gave rise to a woman willing to commit unspeakable acts of cruelty under the guise of self-imposed and deranged religious obligations. In today's episode, we will analyze the Lori Vallow case from the perspective of someone who also spent most of their life having lived in a last day's religious cult. Someone who is deeply involved in a shockingly similar environment, and from that experience can help explain the clear indications of Lori Vallow's guilt, as well as help to shed light on the social structure that allowed her to become an unrepentant and remorseless criminal facing death row in her upcoming trial. And that person's story that I would like to share with you today is my own. Today, we will begin to deconstruct the inner workings of a religious extremist obsessed with her now husband's apocalyptic teachings. A mother who was accused of taking more than just the lives of two beautiful children, former spouses and family members. A woman who became the very embodiment of the darkness she claimed to be fighting, bringing unimaginable destruction upon everyone in her proximity leaving her loved ones covered in the ashes of her transgressions. In today's video, we will uncover the history of Lori Vallow, exploring areas of her life previously misunderstood by the media, including exposing the documented evidence from over a decade ago that proves that she was a threat to her children long before she would be accused of their demise. As we begin to unfurl her caustic web of suffering, you will see firsthand Lori Vallow's head-first dive into the deep end of religious extremism. And it's for that reason that I want to share with you the beginnings of my own story and how I was born and raised in a similar spiritual climate that also religiously proclaimed the imminent end of the world. But this will not be an attempt to empathize with Lori Vallow or her choices. On the contrary, this analysis will help expose the inner workings of cult leaders and how they weaponize religion as a means to ensure compliance. We will discuss how these religious cults instill paranoia, shame, and require a devout dedication to their ideals that only further ostracizes their members from reality and the world. And in a time where misinformation grows in availability on every social media platform available 24 hours a day in the palm of your hand, the ever-increasing threat of cult-like organizations only seems to be growing in number each and every day. And it's for that reason that I want to give you, the viewer, a first-hand look into the life and mind of someone born and raised inside the confined and domineering world of a religious cult. But I also want to share with you the story of how and why so many of us eventually found the courage to break free from those confines, to turn away from those toxic communities for good, and now, by telling our stories, help others to do the same. And finally, coupled with that knowledge, we will contrast the innumerable times Lori Vallow failed to reject religious zealotry, refused any notion of accountability, and denied the responsibility of a mother to protect her own children, and in so doing, became the antithesis of everything she ever claimed to be. This is Deliver Us From Evil, The Lori Vallow Case, Episode 1.
I can still remember the moment when I decided that I would leave the religious cult that I had been a part of for the entirety of my life. If you had asked me at that very moment if I believed that I was in a cult, I would have adamantly denied it. To me, I was just another member of a religious organization that had some fairly militaristic views of Christianity. But now, looking back, I can remember all of the times throughout my childhood and teen years where I felt like something was just very, very wrong. But at that point of my life, my choice to leave wasn't because of all the reasons that are so clear and obvious to me now. I left because I had finally reached a point where I could no longer give in, where I would not trade my integrity in exchange for their required obedience even one more time. I was sick of the super spiritual rules on my life and the constant fear of being caught breaking any one of those rules. I was tired of hiding all my favorite non-Christian music, looking over my shoulder any time I accidentally broke any number of the hundreds of rules that governed our lives. I was just tired and couldn't believe that this was my life. My earliest memories as a child are of being in church. We were always in church. For most of my life, we attended three services on Sunday, a Monday night prayer meeting, a Wednesday night youth service, a Friday night men's group, and if the church was open for any other reason, then we were there. For as long as I can remember, the church dominated every area of my life. The list of things we couldn't do were far more vast than the things that we could. From a child to my teen years, corporal punishment was a part of everyday life. And if I was swatted with a wooden paddle for talking too much in school, then I was also taught that those bruises were the only way to ensure that I didn't fall prey to the devil himself. I was taught that Harry Potter was witchcraft that could allow for demons to possess my soul. That the Simpsons were evil because they taught rebellion. That music was the tool of Satan used to possess our minds and sway our hearts from God. We were taught to be fearful of virtually everything from the moment we were capable of being able to learn anything. In my early teen years, my parents began to participate in conducting exorcisms on a weekly basis which became a part of normal, everyday life for me. And it would only further underscore the idea that the devil was lurking around every corner, waiting to destroy any part of my life that I wasn't ready to defend. Around the same time, I learned that I had the ability to speak in public, and eventually I was asked to speak in my church on a fairly regular basis. Now, because of my perceived spiritual connection with God, I was eventually asked to be a part of the adult men's group in my church, which was considered a great honor. During my first week, I learned that we would be given weekly homework that included meeting with your assigned accountability partner. A short time later, I learned that my father would become my accountability partner. Now, for those of you that are unfamiliar with that term, that meant that my father would effectively become my priest. The men's group required that part of our weekly homework was to memorize large portions of scripture, and each week we were required to meet with our accountability partner. That meant that I was expected to sit with my father and tell him every one of my sins and struggles from the week prior, all of them, no matter how big or small. Imagine being a teenage boy, having to tell your father every sin or mistake you've made, and not just once, but every single week. The expectation of confessing everything, all of my sins to my father, created unimaginable anxiety. I eventually grew to hate those weekly meetings. And these meetings weren't just a suggestion from the group. They were required and expected. Fast forward a decade later, and in this moment of my life, I had just made the decision to step away from my legal career and join the full-time ministry team of a religious institution that I had volunteered with and loved since early childhood. 
I sold my house, picked up my family and my whole life moving out of state because I believed that I needed to do something good with my life that involved helping others in a deeply meaningful way. My heart was in the right place, but I had no idea what I had signed up for. The organization had recruited me to work as a director at the highest level of their ministry, answering only to John, the CEO of their nonprofit organization. John was a man that I had admired and looked up to since I was a child. To me, he was the epitome of everything I ever wanted to be as a believer and as a man. The CEO was very eager to find someone who could come into the organization and help revitalize and redirect the ministry as a whole. And by the time I applied, they had already been looking through thousands of resumes over the course of about six months. But eventually, after multiple weeks of grueling interviews, they called to offer me the job. I was elated and overwhelmed at the opportunity to work for an organization that I had loved for so many years, and then to help make a difference in the lives of people in need. But everything I thought I knew was about to change forever. Walking into my office for the first time, I would quickly realize just how much I had been deceived. Nothing about this ministry was as it had been described to me. Imagine buying your dream house. It's outwardly beautiful and has spacious rooms full of designer furniture, crown moldings, a massive walk-in closet. It has an elevator, an Olympic-sized swimming pool, a game room, and everything you could ever want or imagine. But underneath the fresh coat of paint is black mold. The pipes are broken and rotting. The foundation is crumbling from termite damage. And everything you see is propped underneath paper-thin walls, hiding skeletons in every corner of the house. Within the first few hours of arriving, the former manager that I was now replacing sat with me and told me the actual truth of what was really happening and all the problems that I would be expected to fix. After that initial meeting, a large part of me wanted to turn around and leave, but I wasn't a quitter and this organization had been a part of my life since childhood. Against my better judgment, I stayed and spent the next six months of my life working 70 to 80 hours per week, doing everything in my power to help fix a massive organization that was seemingly falling apart at the seams. But it was what I saw during that time that I will never forget. The countless times I witnessed sleep-deprived interns and staff members who were mistreated, scolded for perceived religious infractions, publicly shamed and forced to comply. The times I saw men and women hiding their sexual identities for fear of being rejected by their friends, their family, and everyone they ever knew. The culture of this organization was toxic. The rules that were thrust upon us were unlike anything you can even imagine, and yet somehow worse than what I experienced growing up. Purity culture doesn't even begin to describe the militant guidelines that were placed on everyone. Flirting, relationships, non-Christian music, eating when you weren't supposed to, watching television, any one of those things could get you fired, removed from the organization, and shunned permanently. And when this community is the one that you were born into, being disgraced for failing to meet those standards is no small thing. But after months of witnessing all of this dysfunction, I knew that I couldn't stay much longer, and I was quickly arriving at my breaking point. For me, the beginning of the end occurred with the confrontation that happened with the CEO shortly before Thanksgiving. The day before Thanksgiving, I had sent an email to the interns in my office, letting them know that they were able to leave early that day, but anyone who wanted could come with me to the local food shelter where we would feed the homeless for an early Thanksgiving meal. Each intern replied, happy to join and eager to serve their community. But a short time later, John would send me an angry and irate email yelling at me for taking the interns out of the office a whole hour early. 
In his email, he berated me for my poor work ethic, despite having already worked 50 hours that week alone. In his email to me, he explained that he was angry that I hadn't finished ghostwriting his book for him yet, and he wanted me to work through the holidays to get it done. For the first time, I remember feeling a sense of profound anger and disappointment because I couldn't believe that a man who claimed to represent a religion founded on the idea of service to others would get so angry when his office was attempting to do exactly that. For me, it was the epitome of hypocrisy and just one of the many reasons that would lead me to walking away for good. And this story that I'm sharing with you right now is an illustration of just how much people in these spaces are willing to go through, especially when you're born into it. The power and control that these organizations have is hard to understand from an outsider's perspective. But when it's all you've ever known, then for you, submitting is a part of everyday life. Something that to this day leaves me with a sense of disgust and dismay unlike anything I have ever experienced since. And my hope in sharing it with you is that it will help to illustrate just how dangerous religious extremism can be when greed and the love of money is allowed to flourish unchecked. I had been asked to conduct an analysis of the entire organization commonly referred to as a SWOT analysis. The CEO had asked me to use my expertise to help figure out a way that we could fix the innumerable problems that he believed existed within the ministry. Right away, I had spent several nights feverishly working on the report, but what he didn't know was that my detailed analysis could be explained in one single sentence. Simply put, no matter what was altered in the organization, regardless of how much we changed our marketing or our approach to ministry or anything else for that matter, that nothing would change until he did. And in our next meeting, I would finally confront him, the man that I had admired and looked up to for the entirety of my life. Because of my position in the ministry, I had worked closely with various other departments of our nonprofit organization, including the development office's administrator, a woman named Tracy. Tracy's primary role was to attract wealthy donors, to court them, to schmooze them, and eventually to get them to donate large sums of money to keep our $10 million a year budget solvent. Now, my office was directly next to the office of the CEO, and because of what I'm guessing was very poor construction, I could hear virtually every word that was spoken in his office whenever my office door was closed. The event that would lead to my departure occurred prior to my meeting with the CEO to discuss my analysis of our organization. I had overheard a conversation between John and Tracy discussing a major donor that they had been courting for well over a year. The donor was very wealthy and she felt a fondness for our ministry, wanting to give a financial gift in her late son's memory. Apparently, he had tragically ended his life, but he had always wanted to be a part of our ministry, so his grieving mother wanted to offer a donation to memorialize the life of her son. I couldn't hear every word perfectly, but I made out that they had landed on a plan to encourage this wealthy grieving mother to donate $1 million, and in return, they would erect a library that would carry his name, including a plaque commemorating his life. A short time later, they made the call, and if you could have heard it, it would have sounded indistinguishable from a high-pressure sales call. I wouldn't find out till some time later that this wealthy donor's son ended his life because he was gay and that the many attempts at conversion therapy by his mother had only solidified his darkest feelings about himself and who he really was. And what's worse is according to people that I worked with, the wealthy donor gave the ministry the full donation of a million dollars. But the library was never built. Several days later, I met with the CEO, providing him with my 14-page SWOT analysis. 
In my report, I explain the areas of the ministry that could be improved, our strengths, weaknesses, as well as possible marketing opportunities. But in my summary, I explained that nothing in the ministry would substantially change. Not until he did. He quietly dismissed it, and after just six months of employment, I provided him with my resignation and would never return to that campus again. Many years later, I would choose to participate in a public effort to expose the hidden corruption I witnessed within that organization, and as a result of what came to light, the ministry would totally and completely collapse. But that's a story for a future episode. This is the first time I have ever spoken of this experience publicly, and I'm sharing it with you now because it helps to illustrate just how powerful the effect religious extremism can have on the lives of everyday people. I will spend the rest of my life knowing that I was a part of an organization that was responsible for harming far too many people through spiritual, emotional, and mental harm that many still deal with today. And knowing that fact helps remind me of a time in my life where I failed, so that the next time I'm faced with a decision of that magnitude, that I will learn from my mistakes and make the right choice. But it's my experience that has helped me to better understand the environment created by religious cults, and how so many people just like me get enticed by them. Over the last several generations, we have witnessed the rise and fall of countless cult leaders, followed by their loyal and passionate believers who truly believe in the work of their organization. But I wanted to understand how so many seemingly well-meaning, good-intentioned people who aren't born into these groups find themselves caught inside of organizations that share all the hallmarks of a religious cult. So in order to better understand the answer to that question, I began to study various religious organizations that could be categorized as cults, and with little variation, I began to notice that they all shared the same reoccurring commonalities. Signs that can help us to better understand the root cause of their formation and how they maintain such considerable control over their members. Because understanding how cult mindsets are formed and exploited will give us vital clues into the Lori Vallow case. Defining any organization as a cult is something that carries a considerable amount of stigma. No one wants to be part of a group that carries a label that is inherently delegitimizing. And yet when we view the effects that these religious extremist groups can have, it's important to be able to identify them as they are. Now, as many of us are already aware, cults are often formed by a charismatic leader who becomes the authoritative figure of the organization. Whether they call themselves a prophet, or in Lori Daybell's case, a translated being, each self-appointed prophet often has their own divine story to tell that attracts like-minded people with similar pre-existing religious beliefs. Oftentimes, the leaders are revered as having a godlike status. Many claim to be able to predict the future through prophecy or claim to see visions of God. Some tell stories of hearing the audible voice of angels or God himself and even purport to speak in heavenly languages. Oftentimes, these leaders attract vulnerable and at-risk people who are already willing to believe in the supernatural and have a much lower threshold of belief. These people quickly become their earliest converts and eventually transform into their most passionate followers. In a very short time, these self-appointed prophets can go from telling stories to small groups of friends to speaking in front of thousands, being given credibility simply by virtue of those willing to listen. Right away, these charismatic leaders begin to institute requirements of absolute loyalty. Using the platform that they speak on behalf of God, they weaponize their following to ensure that any deviation from the plan set out by the leader is both heavily criticized and discouraged. The echo chamber created by the leader becomes an enemy to critical thinking and logic, which is often heavily suppressed and is seen as a form of rebellion. 
Criticism of the leader's authority is a fast track to removal from the group entirely, regardless of intent or merit. Lori Vallow demonstrates this blind devotion throughout the entirety of her public persona. She eventually joined with her friend Melanie Gibb to host a podcast that discussed their religious beliefs in great detail. In this podcast, Lori and Melanie are interviewing Chad a short time after Lori had met Chad for the first time. In this episode, he begins to tell his divine story of having met Jesus Christ and claims to have witnessed the end times in a prophetic vision. Listen closely as we hear the beginnings of what would become an unholy pact between two religious zealots hurtling towards disaster. What are like some of his personality traits? Because I'm interested in like, obviously he was powerful, but like a calm power or what do you, what are your ideas of his personality traits? Um, kindness. There wasn't a sense of judgment at all. He was mm. happy for the progress we'd made in our lives. He was always so kind. There was a couple of scenes I could see where my grandchildren went up to him a little bit timidly, <laughs> but he just bent down on one knee and and held his arms out, and they went right to him, and he just held them tight and smiled up at us as we watched him give them a hug. And it's almost like... A, you know, like a heat, almost a radiant mm. feeling coming off of him all the time. And so just complete acceptance for who we are, wanting us to strive and do better, but I don't know why. He kind of singled me out a couple of times <laughs> and as if we knew each other pretty well. Mm. And... Uh Uh-huh. Sure, Chad. Now, I've spent a lot of time in church, and if you've ever heard this podcast in its entirety, this has to be one of the most ridiculous stories I've ever heard. Chad claims that after a near-death experience, he met Jesus Christ. But if you've listened to the way he tells the story, nothing about it sounds authentic or even real. His entire story sounds like a ridiculously bad Mad Lib made up using second grade vocabulary. But throughout the entire episode, you can hear Lori eating up every word that comes out of his mouth. Which only goes to shed light on how far Lori would go to buy into every aspect of his story, regardless of how ridiculous or far-fetched it sounded. Which leads us to point two in defining a cult. Another significant and common component of a religious cult is the claim to a divinely appointed status. Now, the idea that a group of people are chosen by God isn't unique to cults themselves, but it offers the alluring idea that the group has a special connection that only God could bestow. This was a foundational element of the cult formed by the notorious Jim Jones in the 1970s. Originally, his church started as a means to help bring the community together during a time of significant racial disparity, but would go on to become one of the most horrific tragedies of that time period, and only further underscores the importance of understanding what a cult actually is. Cults often show their true colors by virtue of an elite and superior mentality, which is something that can be heard throughout all of Lori Vallow's podcast episodes. Their entire interview with Chad Daybell is essentially him bragging about his divine experience with Jesus Christ himself. The very notion of being chosen and elite is something that Chad wrote about in his books and discusses at length in virtually every one of his public appearances. He takes well-established biblical doctrine and contorts it to fit his new narrative of being a translated being who has lived many lives. Chad and Lori Daybell could write the playbook on how to identify the beginnings of a cult simply by virtue of listening to their podcast. It's a cautionary and tragic tale that we desperately need to learn from. 
And if you ever come across someone describing an interaction with God in this way, do yourself a favor, run. I love that. Can you also describe for us like what he looks like? I always want to hear it. What sure. he looked like um, to you. Okay. Every time I've seen him, it's been in a glorified form. I haven't really had a vision of him when he, at least a clear vision of what he looked like when he was on the earth. I, but So what I've always seen is a future version, I suppose, or his current version is a resurrected version being but he yeah what is rambling nonsense i'll take made up stories by failed religious authors for 400 but you know what this nonsensical diatribe from chad actually leads us into the third mechanism of defining a cult number three is an increasingly common theme among many modern religious cults and it's the idea that their spiritual position makes them above the law now, for obvious reasons, this is incredibly dangerous and is why any religious institution that teaches their followers to ignore or shrug off legal responsibilities should be viewed as inherently dangerous. The reason being is precisely what we all saw transpire with Lori Vallow. She believes that she is a part of a revelation end times apocalyptic group that is referred to as the 144,000. She would even tell friends and family that the world was coming to an end in July of 2020. And of course, that didn't happen. And we can use her own religious beliefs against her because any time a supposed prophet makes a claim that doesn't come true, then according to her own religious beliefs, that would make her a false prophet. And this matters when you consider how many people end up being deceived by this kind of religious misinformation. It's not harmless, even if it doesn't teach extreme ideologies like the one that Lori would later adopt. Sadly, more often than not, the end result is the people who fall prey to these kinds of teachings end up losing their life savings, their homes, and eventually their relationships with their families. Radical and extreme religious teaching has far-reaching effects, and you only need to look at the lives of the family members left holding the pieces of what remains of these families to see that. But more and more, this kind of elitism taught within many modern cults today that teaches that they are above the law is far too common a fundamental precept and just like the case of Lori Vallow, the end result is often disastrous. Number four is something that I experienced frequently throughout large portions of my adolescence. In my many years of studying cults, I learned that my church used a fairly common tactic that can be found throughout many modern cults today. Now, while ritualistic worship isn't inherently dangerous, when they are used as a means to control people, they can go from acts of worship to a mechanism of control. Many times, modern cults will use simple things like prayer, fasting, scripture reading, and meditation, or in my case, lengthy church services where music was used as a means to incite deeply emotional experiences from the congregation. The common thread for so many of us that found ourselves caught in these organizations was that each of us had the same or similar religious backgrounds. We didn't choose it. We were born into it. And for most of us, it was all we ever knew. So when I would hear the beautiful, powerful worship music using emotional power ballads that encouraged us to expressively interact with our faith along with our peers, it wasn't uncommon to spend hours singing songs, seeing hundreds of other people my age, expressing their emotions in a very outward way. While nothing about this is inherently wrong, in my case, it did prey on our feelings in a way that made us feel deeply loyal to the organization. And this eventually led to many of us tolerating extreme and militant rules over our lives that governed every aspect of what we were or weren't allowed to do. 
And so many of us tolerated it because the ritual of music and singing became something we grew to expect each week, which became something we grew to want, which would then become something we absolutely needed. And before I knew it, I believed that the only way that I could properly interact with God was in that space, singing those songs with that ministry. For me and countless others, it created a spiritual dependency that was created intentionally to ensure our commitment and loyalty to the organization. But indoctrination doesn't happen overnight, and to those observing it, it's hard to understand. But it's like the frog getting boiled in the pot of water. By the time you realize it's burning you, you've already been there so long that getting out seems completely impossible. In my research and viewing the case of Lori Vallow, she would often discuss her own spiritual actions, touting them as an outward sign of her superiority. Many times she can be heard discussing her own ritualistic acts in relation to her newfound religious beliefs, sounding as though she's bragging that her faith and relationship to God is almost godlike. And this is something we are about to analyze in greater detail throughout her conversation recorded by her former best friend, Melanie Gibb. Number five of defining a cult is one of the most damaging and destructive elements of modern cults today and demonstrates their profound impact on the lives of those who espouse their beliefs. Members who have dared to make the mistake of speaking against the organization in any way, whether it be questioning the leader, speaking out against negative behavior from members of the cult, or any form of outspoken detraction against them, is often met with swift and immediate retribution. One of the most significant examples of this behavior can be seen in the Scientology movement over the last 50 years. The Church of Scientology is notorious for their swift action against anyone who dares speak against their organization. They have been known to hire personal investigators to stalk, harass, and publicly malign former members for years, which of course has the cumulative effect of silencing anyone who might think about speaking poorly of the organization as a whole. Shunning former members is an extreme measure by cults to ensure compliance and to fearfully engage existing members into complete obedience. And when we view the case of Lori Vallow, there are clear signs of her engaging in this very behavior with her friends, her spouses, her family, and then tragically, her own children. And in my experience, any organization that does not allow their members to leave freely on their own accord is a group that likely has something to hide. Because if they are a group truly worth joining, then they should value and cherish the importance of free will for all its members, regardless of reason. The sixth and final element of defining a cult is usually one of the first and most noticeable parts of a religious cult. Simply put, cults are often identified by their extreme and outlandish beliefs. For countless centuries, groups have arisen claiming to predict the end of the world. And yet, no matter how prolific or profound the prophet claims to be, those predictions have never come true. One of the most recent and notable organizations to become known for this kind of end-of-the-world predictions is that of the Jehovah Witnesses. Their organization has a long history of failed predictions of the end of the world, dating back to the turn of the 20th century. But extreme belief seems to be a common thread held in some form or fashion to all of the major cult organizations that have sprung up over the last 100 years. These organizations often teach and stoke an environment that encourages members to maintain a sense of paranoia in how the outside world is viewed. Those outside of the group are often viewed as dangerous and members are cautioned to avoid interacting with people who are not like-minded. They are often taught to be wary of those who do not share their same religious viewpoints. And it's this paranoid mentality that can be seen through so much of Lori Vallow's interactions 
with her friends and family, which we are about to analyze in detail. Melanie Gibb was a close friend of Lori Vallow and was the same Melanie who co-hosted the Feel the Fire podcast that we listened to earlier. Once law enforcement had become involved in trying to locate JJ, Melanie would conduct a phone call with Lori in an attempt to confront her concerning his whereabouts, as well as her very suspicious behavior. This phone call helps to show the mindset of Lori Vallow and the depths that she had descended to prior to her arrest. In this initial call, Melanie Gibb is calling her former best friend shortly after Lori had asked her to lie to the police. This interaction begins to shed light on just how deeply ingrained Lori's religious viewpoints have become and how deep into the cult mindset she already is. This recorded conversation was played during one of the pretrial hearings that occurred early in the prosecution of this case. Let's listen into the call as it was played in its entirety before the court. Hey, Lori. How are hey, you? let me put on speaker. Oh, okay. All right. We're enough with the phone. <laughs> How are you guys? We're okay. How are you doing, babe? I'm doing pretty good, thanks. I was wondering, where, where are you guys? We're just hanging out. Hanging out? Are you, are you in Idaho? We're no. in Idaho. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to ask you a question, if you don't mind, Lori. Yeah, um, I want to know, um, you remember we talked about JJ going to Case House, and you told me they went there, and now he's not there? I was wondering what happened. Well, I had to move him somewhere else because of her actions, so... Was she, was she doing something? Like, was she trying to come get him or something? Or, like, trying to kidnap him? Well, she's, yeah, she's said that lots of times before, but... Melanie Gibb has called Lori and Chad in an attempt to try and understand what's going on. Right away, Melanie starts the conversation by asking the couple where they are, and they outright refuse to tell her. And that alone would be odd enough if not coupled with the fact that Lori has been lying to everyone concerning the whereabouts of JJ. Eventually, JJ and Tylee both would go missing, their whereabouts being completely unknown to anyone other than Lori. Now, of course, we now know that they were both buried in Chad's backyard, and knowing that is important to this entire call. Lori is trying to insinuate that she's protecting Melanie and anyone else from knowing where JJ and Tylee are because of some imagined threat, which speaks to our previous efforts to define a cult. Paranoia is often a very common trait seen in those who are active participants of religious cults. And I believe that this is one of the areas that Lori's case is going to be fought in her upcoming trial. Right now, her defense likely wants the implication that Lori has lost her mind and she's not mentally well enough to know the difference between right and wrong. But there is a massive difference between religious extremism and a mental health disorder. And while we cannot rule out the fact that she may have underlying mental health issues, Lori Uvalo very clearly knew what she was doing and did so with righteous indignation, something you're about to hear throughout the entirety of this call. Um. Okay, I, well, when, you know, when I asked Chad the other day, I was like, hey, um, you know, where, where is JJ? And he said, for my security, he didn't want me to know. So is there a reason I should be in danger to know where he is? <laughs> no, it's nobody. It's his danger. It's the danger that there's people after me. Okay. So well, it, that if you knew, that puts you in a danger. Well, just in a bad position. Yeah, a bad position. Everybody, right. if they don't know anything, then they don't have to say they know. Right, so you're just worried. Okay. Um, I'm just to keep him protected and... And keep you protected. And keep yeah. everybody else. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, 
Well, I was wondering why you told the police why he was with me. I just needed to use, have somebody that I, so I wouldn't have to tell them where he really was because they were going to tell Kay where he is. The reoccurring theme of paranoia is something that will continue to remain at the forefront throughout the entirety of this call. But it's important to remember that Kay Woodcock is JJ's grandmother, and she only ever wanted to protect him. She wasn't a threat to Lori. She was just trying to find her grandson. And eventually, when Lori is confronted concerning the fact that she asked Melanie to lie to the police for her, she doesn't even attempt to offer an apology or even an explanation that would make sense to anyone with a functioning brain. She blames Kay as though she's responsible for why she's lying to the police. And when you contrast her statements against the fact that she is now being tried for ending the lives of her own children, it only exposes the brutality and inhuman cruelty of a woman who could use everyone around her to achieve her own selfish ambitions. Lori Vallow used the tenets of a cult to nearly successfully hide her crimes in plain sight, but very soon she will be held to account for what she's done, and I for one cannot wait to see it. Oh, yeah, so is it, do you think it's like your family, or you know, like your family, your dad, or you know, those well, my people? Family, well, not my whole family, but you, as you know, most of my family is working against me and yeah. With her, basically. Yeah. Is JJ safe? He is safe and happy. He's safe and happy. Knowing what I know about Lori now, it's very obvious what she means when she says this. She's very clearly referring to him in the spiritual sense, and I just can't help but be disgusted by her dismissive and arrogant comment. And now that we know where JJ was when she said this, it only further demonstrates just how vile her actions truly are. Okay, well that's good to hear. Um, are you afraid of anything? Like, are you afraid to tell me that you're just afraid that he, um, that I could be in danger? Like you're, you know, like I don't, like if I knew, like, how could that hurt me? I don't understand how that could hurt me if I knew where he was. Well, I'm just not telling anybody so that nobody has to say where he is or get questioned to where he is so I can keep him as safe as possible. Yeah. Um, okay, I hope, well, I hope that he's okay. I hope you guys are okay. I did have a question that I asked Al at one point, your brother, um, if... Um, if I wanted to know, you know, um, like where he was, and he said I did not want to know, and that he could not be found. So what does that mean? I don't know why he would say that, but it's the same story. Like, I, yeah. I, I, I don't even want Al to know. I don't want anybody to know so that nobody has to be worried about it. I mean, nobody has to be... Yeah questioned about it so he can be safe. Alex Cox, the hitman brother of Lori Vallow, was very clearly telling Melanie Gibb that she didn't want to know what actually happened to JJ. But Lori's response is an inside look into how deluded she's allowed herself to become inside her own narrative of lies. As we know, Lori believed that her children had become zombies and that they weren't actually even her children anymore. But it's my firm belief that she was only using her extreme religious views to justify what she already wanted to do. And this was a very common experience that I've had when I was still part of that kind of religious environment. These people would often arrive at conclusions that they had already previously formed in their mind by using various religious texts to match their belief in a way that offered them justification for their position, a position that otherwise wouldn't hold under religious scrutiny. 
It allowed them to ignore naysayers because they had imagined that they've been given some spiritual authority from God himself. And this is one of the many core problems with extreme religious views. It can be used to justify almost anything, even things that we could not begin to fathom or imagine. Yeah, so are you, I mean, are you, how, how long are you going to be away for? Like, how, I mean, are you ever going to be able to come out and come back to society again? Or are you going to keep, you know, like, come back? I mean, like, what does that look like? I will do whatever the Lord needs me to do every day, so. Okay. Well, I just wondered if I was ever going to see you again. Absolutely, you will. Okay, so. Yep. So maybe when they're done chasing you, you'll be able to come out of, maybe they will come out again or? Yeah, I mean, it's a ridiculous thing for them to be working with Kay to find me. There's nothing that's gone on that's, you know what I'm saying? Like they're working with her in some dark capacity. The police yeah. are working with her in some mm-hmm. dark capacity. There's no reason for them to be after me mm-hmm. in the first place. Hmm. Yeah, has she has she threatened you at all? Yes, lots of times. Oh boy, like did she, what did she say? Watching Kay Woodcock respond to Lori's ridiculous claims is so satisfying and revealing. The idea that Lori actually expects anyone to believe that they were maliciously working with the police to go after Lori is both evidence of her instability as a person, but even more so that she was a threat to her children for years before any of this actually transpired. During my investigation of this case, my research team and I went through thousands of pages of records, including documents that stemmed back as early as 2007. In a document that we will discuss at the end of this episode, Lori Vallow was seen as a threat to her own children over a decade ago, long before she even knew the name Chad Daybell or referred to herself as a translated being. And this only goes to show just how badly our judicial system needs reform when a person can be described as an imminent danger to their own children, and then nothing is done. We desperately need to remember who this case is about. The innocent men, women, and children who have died because law enforcement categorically refused to see Lori Vallow as the threat that she was to literally everyone around her. Lori's own husband, Charles Vallow, begged the police to intervene, and they practically laughed in his face. If we learn anything from this case, it should be that it does not matter what you look like, what your background is, or who you are. If you act this way, then you do not deserve to be raising children underneath your household. And until we learn that lesson, this situation will happen again, and I will do everything I can to speak loudly to ensure that something, anything, is done to stop it. Well, it's in emails and everything. So, mm. so like, she said she was going to come take them, or she was... There's a lot of things. Yeah. Nellie. Well, I know it sounds like it. I'm just worried for you guys because, you know, he's missing... And, you know, <laughs> I know exactly where he is. He's perfectly okay. fine. Okay, well, I hope so. I had, I had a scripture I wanted to share with you, if you don't mind. I love it. I was thinking about some of the things you guys have gone through, and I saw this scripture today, and I wanted to, I want you to comment. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question yeah. about scripture. Okay. okay. So, did Alma turn himself into King Noah? Or what did, was he required to do? So when we work with the Lord and are obedient, he has, he's going to protect us from adversarial darts and all kinds of negativity. But when we open the door to Satan, he comes in and then he attacks. And then he takes away to make it look like somebody else took it away. But that's not how God works. He doesn't work in darkness. 
I agree with you 100%. And that's what the Lord is doing for me. Exactly what he's doing for me. Oh, no, it just, it just, it just we sounds weird. We have not open for darkness, Mel. Darkness is knocking on the door all the time because that's the way dark works with the light. Now, for the sake of posterity, I'm going to give you a brief summary of the prior few minutes that I omitted between Lori and Melanie mainly because it's just boring to listen to, but both are demonstrating the major problem that exists when you allow yourself to delve too far into the outer recesses of religious dogma. Lori is using Mormon scripture to demonstrate why all of her actions are completely justified and how she perfectly emulates all of their religious belief systems, And, of course, Melanie counters with differing scripture that demonstrates how wrong Lori is about everything. But you know what isn't happening right now? To this point, Melanie Gibb has successfully flown under the radar and acted as though she was an innocent bystander in this entire debacle. But not once have I heard from Melanie Gibb about how sorry she is for enabling Lori and giving her a platform on her podcast to propagate her ludicrous religious ideologies in the first place. Melanie Gibb allowed Chad Daybell to come onto her podcast and for an entire episode tell stories that sounded like the nonsensical ramblings of someone who is not in touch with reality. But their entire back and forth only helps to show just how detrimental these beliefs can become when someone who helped create them cannot reason with Lori and is quickly becoming one of the many naysayers who she will consider dark or aligned with the devil himself. But listen to how quickly things continue to devolve as Lori begins to push back on any claims that she is responsible for creating this situation in the first place. And I promise you that I have done nothing wrong in this case, but sometimes you have to hide in the cavity of a rock for your own life safety. And that's what the Lord requires of you sometimes. And that's how it is. And I'm sorry that's how it is because there is a lot of darkness on the earth. I know. Mm-hmm. This after me for zero reason. Besides the darkness of Kay, which you already know she's dark. I, I, I haven't met her enough to know if she's dark or not. I've just met her slightly, and she seemed like a normal kind of person, but then I haven't engaged with her that much, so I don't know that personally. So you don't know about her changing the thing to for herself to be the beneficiary of the policy and all that stuff? None of that's dark, right? Well, I haven't seen those documents, so I have no way of knowing. Lori's comment about Kay in this situation shows us how completely malevolent of a person Lori Vallow truly is. Lori is referring to a $1 million life insurance policy that was in the name of her former husband, Charles Vallow, the same husband that she is now accused of having participated in his homicide. She is clearly under the misconception that Kay had something to do with the beneficiary being changed, when in fact, Charles himself changed the policy because he was fearful that Lori would have him killed, which as we know, is exactly what happened. And mere days after she had her brother end her husband's life, she calls the life insurance company in an attempt to collect on those funds, and only then learned that the beneficiary had been changed. Lori is the perpetual victim and wants everyone to feel sorry for her, no matter what the circumstance or how clearly the fault lies with her. She's arguing with Melanie that Kay is the person who's dark because she's now going to be the recipient of those funds that she somehow feels entitled to. This is the epitome of evil, when someone cares more for the monetary benefit from a loved one's death than they do what is right or wrong. And that is the reason that I discuss this case now, because justice has not yet been served, and if Lori has her way, she will do whatever she can to buck responsibility, pretend to be mentally incompetent the way that she has so many times before, and we owe it to her many victims to ensure that she is held accountable for her many crimes. 
because Lori Vallow is not the victim in this case. She's the perpetrator, and nothing can or will ever change that fact. I've seen them on my computer. No, I have not. I haven't even looked in on your computer before. You haven't showed me anything. I don't know why you're being controversial to me or if you're recording this conversation for the police or whatever. I don't know what your intention is on this phone call. Well, what? I love with all my heart, and I have forever, and well, I will always see you. I appreciate those words, but if you really love me, you wouldn't have told the police that I had JJ with me. That's not that's not what a friend does. I mean, that just makes me look weird, and it, it just, it's not safe for me. That doesn't look good. I mean, you had to think of my welfare if you love me. I do, and I did exactly what I felt the Lord was instructing me to do. And I appreciate you, and I love you. And I never do anything to harm you. And you can have all of this confirmed to you by the Lord. I have. And my my conscience is clear. I feel very understanding what's really going on, Lori. And I believe that look, I believe that you have been very deceived by Satan. I believe that he has tricked you. And I just I don't believe that what you're doing is correct. I just don't. I mean, Tammy dies, and then your husband died, and then these, and then he's missing. It just doesn't sound like God's plan to me. It just sounds. It gives me a gut feeling. Like in my gut, it feels weird. It doesn't feel right. I don't have peace about it. I never have felt 100% peace about it. I always felt like a little weird in my stomach about all these things. You know me, Mel. You know me. This does not sound like you. This sounds like you've been influenced by somebody dark who wants you to believe dark things and have fear and have fear of the celestial world. I don't have fear. This is a classic example of religious gaslighting and is something that cult members become exceptionally good at doing. Lori has been confronted over the fact that she lied to the police and asked her friend to lie for her. She doesn't offer an explanation or anything that could even come close to an apology. Instead, she tries to blame it all on God, saying that she was only doing what she believes she was told to do. This is a complete and total cop-out, and it is the epitome of everything wrong with religious extremism. Because in this situation, no matter how evil your actions, you can simply claim that God told you to do it. It serves multiple purposes. It removes the blame and responsibility from you and allows Lori to state whatever she's done has been given a divinely inspired green light from God himself. But even worse, it allows for the inference of a mental health defect because who in their right mind could possibly believe any of this? Clearly, Lori Vallow must be insane and therefore not mentally fit to stand trial. And when Melanie pushes back and claims that she doesn't believe her, then Lori is able to lump her into the same group of dark-minded, Satan-influenced zombies, and we already know what she does with those people in her life. And it's for that reason that I want to encourage you the next time you know someone beginning to go down the path of wanting to join an organization that has cult-like beliefs, you may want to think twice about staying quiet because what is a small, non-threatening belief today could become a fully-fledged devotion to a total lie tomorrow. And you never know, you may be the only voice of reason that remains in that person's life. You obviously do. Now I have a piece of conscience and I can see clearly. Well, I'm sorry that you feel that way. I love you so much. I know you do. I don't know what else to say. Stand Christ when he comes again and he's coming soon and we will all stand there and you will know at that point that he has supported me and has supported me the whole time and I have not been deceived. I just want to testify that I I know Tammy and their conspiracy theories. My sister-in-law's right 
behind it all, and I hope that you're not being influenced by that dark team. I don't know who she is. I'm sorry, you oh, said your sister-in-law? I don't even know her. Oh, I know, but she's coming up with the same type of theories. Mm-hmm. And it's just not true. My own children were there. They testified that Tammy had been getting weaker and sick, and I begged her to go to the doctor. There's, She just... Her heart was failing her. She was physically falling apart, but she hates doctors, and mm-hmm. she just passed away. Um, that's how it happened. My son Garth was right there with me the whole time. My kids were with, at the house within a 20 minutes of her passing. Like, there were two coroners. They checked her out right there on the bed. Chad is lying, and everyone knows that now. Earlier this year, it was revealed that in a subsequent autopsy conducted on Tammy Daybell, the family members of Chad Daybell were told that Tammy had been asphyxiated. While the findings of the autopsy have not yet been made public, the fact that the family has already been told that the cause of death was asphyxiation is a considerable factor that points to a homicide. And coupled with the fact that law enforcement in Arizona has also re-examined the death of Charles Vallow, we now have a long list of deaths laid at the doorstep of Lori and Chad Daybell. And in addition to their extreme religious views, it is now apparent that Lori used her religion as a shield to protect her from the litany of crimes that she is accused of committing against anyone who dared to stand in her way. This is not a story of religious persecution, but rather of a homicidal religious zealot who did not care for anyone other than herself and her own wicked agenda. What is incredibly apparent is that Lori Vallow is a truly dangerous human being, and if there was ever a time that the justice system needs to work, it's now, because she is a clear and present danger to anyone and everyone in her path. All these conspiracy theories just make me sick to my stomach. Uh, just absolutely sick. I know I've been told for years that Tammy would pass away at a young age. Mm-hmm. And I had no idea that Lori would even be a part of my life. I just knew that I, my life had two segments. And that I know Tammy's on a special mission and she's with my kids. She's visited them. Just, there's so much, Melanie, that you, you just have to have faith. And this is not some sort of master plan. There's no way, Lori, and I could ever come up with this. It's just... You can understand my concern, correct? I can from an outside perspective, but from an... From someone who knows as much as you know? No, not really. <laughs> But we can feel Dave's influence on you. I can feel that, for sure. He's a very good man, and he has a very strong foundation that I know. I know, but he seems to be the one that's putting the doubts in your mind. No, no. You know what? I I have come to understand that my gut feeling, I was not listening to it. And I always felt uncomfortable with many things. Okay. Well, I'm sorry that I included you in those teachings then for your own sake because I wish that you didn't have as much knowledge as you have as you will be accountable for the knowledge that you do have, no? So will you. What Lori just said was a threat. In the Christian world, when someone tells you that you will be held accountable for what you know, that is virtually no different than saying to them, you are going to suffer unimaginable pain for the things you know and for choosing to walk the path that you're on. It's as close as you can get to outright condemning someone without coming out and actually saying that. Again, this serves to show just how dangerous of a person Lori Vallow is to every single person around her. I started this video by discussing my own departure from a religious cult that dominated my life from early childhood. I did that for a very specific reason, because despite my decades of programming, indoctrination, and years of religious belief, there came a point where I had to make a critical decision. 
After years witnessing the hypocrisy, the greed, and the countless contradictions, I knew that the time had come where I had to choose. I had come to the realization that staying quiet and being silent was no different than participating in the actions that would lead to harming people that I claimed to care about. My choice to leave doesn't make me heroic. On the contrary, my choice took much longer than it should have. But there comes a point in every person's life where you have to choose between what you believe and what is right. And after having made that choice in my own life, I realized that people like Lori Vallow use religion as a means to hide who they truly are. And it's my hope that in exposing the truth, that this time the justice system will hold her accountable for the litany of pain that she's brought on her family. Because what I'm about to show you will only help to explain why this is long overdue. In 2007, Vivian Lewis was tasked by the court to help with an assessment related to the custody battle between Lori Vallow and her former husband, Joseph Ryan. She had accused him of unspeakable acts against their children that were later determined to be unfounded. But in the report issued by Miss Lewis, she would issue some extremely concerned warnings to the court that I want to read to you today. She said, and I quote, With the knowledge and understanding available to me today, and based on 32 years of experience, I am gravely concerned regarding the reaction of the recommendations in this report by the mother, Miss Lori Vallow. I am deeply concerned and consider the situation to be one labeled as imminent danger of a flight risk. As well, Miss Vallow is a devout Mormon who has mentioned to me that death would be an option before giving Tylee to her father, Mr. Joseph Ryan, even for a visit. These are real and serious concerns. The imminent danger potential or flight or worse combined with this mother being so adamant that Tylee is being hurt by her father make the likelihood of her cooperation and delivery of this child most unlikely. This letter was dated and delivered to the court on July the 27th of 2007. In closing, I want to remind everyone of the true victims of this case. Far too often their stories get buried underneath the avalanche of the crimes committed against them, and far too often they are left as an afterthought by the media. But in our pursuit of justice, we remember the joy that J.J. Vallow was to the world, the smiles that Tylee Ryan brought to her family and those who loved her. We remember Charles Vallow and the exceptional father and man that he will be remembered as by everyone who knew him. And we remember Tammy Daybell as a mother and as a friend. They will not be forgotten. Now I want to thank you for taking the time to join me today. As many of you know, I am still recovering from pneumonia, which you can probably hear in my voice throughout this entire video. It's been a rough few weeks getting back on my feet, but so many of you have offered kind words of support, and I can't thank you enough for all that you've done to encourage me through my recovery. Now, as always, if you enjoyed today's content, please consider subscribing. It may seem trivial, but doing things like liking and commenting actually really helps our channel grow and continue to reach new audiences every day. So thank you in advance for your support. This channel has already grown so much because of each of you. And for that, I am forever grateful. I also want to give a huge thank you to our amazing Patreon and YouTube supporters. Most of our content ends up getting demonetized here on YouTube. And because of that, our supporters have become the lifeblood of the BCM community. Each of you are appreciated so much, and I am truly grateful to be part of such an amazing group of people. 
And over the next few weeks, I'll be working on new episodes for the Chris Watts and Jody Arias case, as well as new series for Sarah Boone, Chandler Halderson, and much more. So stay tuned. I want to wish everyone an amazing holiday season and thank you so much for spending part of your day here with me. It's truly a blessing to be able to share part of my story with each of you. And I'm looking forward to all the new episodes coming in 2023. It's going to be an amazing year. This has been Behind Criminal Minds. We'll see you next time.